So we're going to move on to hip dislocations. Again, it's a little bit less involved, and so we can hopefully power through this in the next uh, 18 minutes or so. We're going to start with a question, uh, number, number 24. So we have a 26-year-old female uh, in an awkward fall while intoxicated, and she undergoes a closed reduction uh, of the injury that is seen in the figure. Uh, so figure A shows the injury, and uh, as we can see here, we have what looks like a dislocated hip. Figure B shows that it has been nicely reduced. And uh, going through the options, I'll try to kind of make this brief and not necessarily go through each uh, uh, each option here. But the the correct answer is to get a post-reduction CT scan. And we're going to see this theme throughout this uh, little talk here. It's a very important point that a post-reduction CT scan is uh, basically absolutely necessary to get afterwards to evaluate anything that could be going on within the joint or uh, involving the bony structures. Uh, so hip dislocations are fairly rare, uh, but they're a high energy mechanism and so uh, therefore they're usually associated with other injuries. Uh, the reason they're typically secondary to high injury uh, mechanisms because the hip joint is inherently stable due to the bony anatomy and the associated soft tissues such as the labrum capsule and the ligamentum. Uh, they can be uh, classified in a couple different ways. A simple dislocation is essentially just a pure dislocation uh, with no associated uh, bony injuries. A complex dis uh, dislocation will have an associated fracture either involving the acetabulum or the femoral head, femoral neck, or other parts of the proximal femur. Um, we can classify these anatomically, which is probably the most useful. Honestly, uh, either the hip can come out behind the acetabulum or it could come out in front of the acetabulum. The posterior dislocations are by far the most common, representing approximately 90% of these dislocations. Uh, they typically occur with uh, the knee and the hip flexed, and then the hip slightly adducted and maybe internally rotated. You see this. Uh, in this illustration, a fairly typical dashboard type of injury where the dashboard comes in on the knee and pushes the hip out of the back. Uh, the position of the hip, the amount of flexion, and the amount of uh, abduction or adduction will determine what other associated injuries are going to occur, if any. Uh, dislocations in general and posterior dislocations are associated with uh, osteonecrosis, posterior wall fractures of the acetabulum, femoral head fractures, uh, the sciatic nerve injuries uh, due to the close uh, proximity of the nerve behind the hip joint there. And again, because it generally comes from an axial force through the knee, there is a, a, a large association with the ipsilateral knee injuries of at least 25%. Uh, anterior dislocations can be further described as occurring either uh, superiorly or inferiorly. Uh, and that all depends on the position of the hip. The more extended the hip is at the point of dislocation, that femoral head will like is more likely to end up superior to the obturator. Uh, the more flexed the hip is, the more likely that femoral head is to uh, end up at the level of the obturator foramen. Uh, and you'll have a little bit clinical uh, different uh, clinical appearance difference between those two. Um, the uh, these symptoms kind of a uh, kind of funny because of course there's going to be acute pain and inability to bear weight. Uh, keep in mind these are almost always associated with high energy trauma, other than maybe an occasional awkward fall. But these patients are generally miserable. Uh, they're painful. They don't want you to move their leg at all. There's not necessarily a deformity per se, rather than a, a position of the leg that is fairly typical with uh, both posterior and anterior dislocations. Uh, Moving on to the next question again, so we got a 30-year-old driver, again, a young patient in a motor vehicle crash, so it's a high energy uh, injury situation and sustains this injury. Uh, so what we see here on this uh, assumed right side, uh, again, looks like a femoral head dislocation from the acetabulum uh, with no obvious fractures noted at this point. So what is the most likely injury associated with this? So keep in mind, we talked about uh, most of the time a posterior hip dislocation, which that appears to be, uh, is going to be associated with a knee injury. So one and two are uh, probably our most likely um, uh, 
associated injuries, and it turns out that it's the meniscus tear that is uh, going to be more likely than any major ligamentous injury. Um, again, this just kind of describes what we just talked about. Very important to look at the ipsilateral knee, examine that knee after you have your uh, hip reduced, uh, and see if there's any further investigation needed based on your uh, physical exam. Uh, so evaluating these patients, high energy injuries, so most of the time they're going to go through the ATLS protocol. Um, again, the posterior hip dislocation is the most common uh, and associated with other uh, types of fractures. Um, the, hip, the leg generally is going to be sitting with the hip and the knee slightly flexed and the leg uh, internally rotated and adducted. You want to make sure you document document and perform a good neurovascular exam specifically of the ankle dorsiflexion and toe dorsiflexion and also plantar flexion. Make sure you document that whether or not that is present or whether or not that evaluation is available to you. A lot of these patients are obtunded or intubated because of other injuries, but it's very important to document the status of the sciatic nerve in both branches. Uh, because you don't want to have a successful closed reduction, uh, but the nerve is not working and you're not sure whether that was pre-existing or not. Uh, and also examine the knee and check your chest x-rays to look for any other associated injuries uh, because these high energy uh, sudden stop type of impact injuries are going to be associated with significant chest trauma as well. Uh, uh, so again, here's uh, just an article backing that point up. Uh, this reports a 93% rate of ipsilateral knee injury, but if you look at that, that's just counting knee effusions and bone bruising as injuries, and the mo next most common injury are meniscus tears of up to 30%. Uh, anterior dislocations are going to have a different presentation in the, in the position of their leg. You can see in this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in this uh, photograph, we have a hip flexion and knee flexion, but we're way abducted and externally rotated as that thermal head is sitting in front of the acetabulum. Um, on posterior, we're jumping back now to posterior dislocations. Uh, sometimes it's a subtle finding, but if you're, con if you're not certain if it's an anterior or posterior based on your clinical examination, or if you only have x-rays, you can try to make a determination if your femoral heads are of different size, and the smaller one is usually the one that is dislocated. Uh, you want to look at Shenton's line. Uh, and to see if there's disruption of that. Obviously, this one is far disrupted off of the inferior uh, portion of the uh, superior ramus, uh, but sometimes that's very subtle, especially if there's an associated posterior wall fracture. It could be a very subtle finding, and oftentimes it can be missed. Uh, the dislocation can be missed. Um, make sure you're looking uh, closely at your femoral neck and make sure there's no fracture line present because the last thing you want to do is pull on that and then knock your head completely off, and then you've caused a much greater problem. Uh, and make sure you evaluate the appropriate x-rays afterwards, check your AP pelvis and Jude views, and then again you always got to get a CT scan afterwards to look inside the joint for associated injuries or any intra-articular loose bodies. Uh, next question, 41 year old female, again younger age, uh, had a high-speed motor vehicle uh, collision. Uh, sustain this injury, which is again kind of what you typically get in the trauma bay. You got your uh, trauma board underneath uh, that's kind of obscuring some detail and some buckles that are kind of right in the area where your injury is. But you see your femoral head sitting superiorly to your acetabulum. So we know we have at least a dislocation. Uh, and the question states that we have a successful closed reduction. Uh, what is the next appropriate step uh, to evaluate this? And again, they're hammering this home. Uh, CT scan of that pelvis and, and, and acetabulum is very important to evaluate because you want to make sure there's no intraarticular loose bodies that need to be removed or any other associated injuries or you, you want to evaluate uh, the other bony structures. Uh, that they're kind of hammering that home. So CT scan is going to be helpful to determine the direction of dislocation. We typically obviously want to have the CT scan done after uh, reduction of the dislocation, but more and more frequently these patients are coming in and going right to the CT scanner after their initial resuscitation bef and before we're allowed to even touch them. So we're getting a lot of these CT scans done with the hip dislocated 
And sometimes it can be helpful to let you know what is going on. You can see the impaction of the posterior aspect of the femoral head on the anterior acetabulum, which is a fairly common finding. And you know that might take quite a bit of effort to get that uh, put back in. But again, highlighted in green here, post-reduction CT must be performed for all traumatic hip dislocations. And we're looking for femoral head fractures and loose bodies and uh, acetabular fractures. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is another pre-reduction uh, CT scan that's uh, suggesting that there's something going on inside the joint. It doesn't look like bone, so it might be a piece of cartilage or something sitting inside there. Uh, so that is helpful to know, but that in and, in and of itself is not going to stop me from trying to put that back into place. Uh, but again, we put it back into place and get another CT scan to see what happened to that. Uh, and this is looking at your, this is demonstrating the femoral head fracture that's evident. I mean, that's uh, pretty plain to see that you've broken that off, and the head, head is partially in place, uh, and depending on the size of that, you may not be able to get a good reduction of that. That might be a post-reduction uh, CT scan. Here's a quite large loose body uh, in, impinging between the acetabulum and the femoral head, and you can see the large space uh, between the... It, in between the two bones and making the joint space quite a bit larger. If you, if you see this on your x-rays, you're uh, pretty certain that there's something going on and may not even need a CT scan to confirm that, but you still should get it to see exactly or try to determine what is in there and where it's coming from. And then this just shows a series of uh, images depicting this uh, posterior wall acetabulum fracture uh, that is uh, best visualized on CT scan. Uh, question number three, uh, we've got a 35-year-old man, again, another young patient, a restrained driver, high-speed motor vehicle. So, again, kind of just hammering on that point that these are high-energy injuries typically. Uh, this guy is doing a lot worse. So this is uh, where we kind of come in secondarily. This guy is diaphoretic, tachycardic, and uh, hypotensive. So something's going on. He also has diminished lower extremity pulses. Uh, he's got mediastinal, mediastinal widening. And uh, which of these injuries is going to be associated with this picture? Um, it's kind of a easy question to answer in this context because we're talking about hip dislocations. But we have your femoral neck fracture in figure A. We have an intertrochanteric fracture under figure B. Both of these are typically old person fractures but can also be high energy. We have a hip dislocation, which we know is generally high energy. We have a subtrochanteric femur fracture, which if you look closely, has an atypical look to it. So I suspect that that's more of a low energy. And then we have the non-displaced pubic rami fracture. So even though that's a pelvic fracture, uh, the minim minimal displacement suggests that it might not be that high of energy mechanism. Uh, so we're going to go with the uh, figure C, hip dislocation. So the the most common uh, thoracic injury associated with that, with the hip dislocation, or the, the thor thoracic aorta rupture. Uh, again, it's a deceleration trauma mechanism. The body stops, the heart keeps going, or the, the uh, steering wheel comes in and causes an impact. Uh, the hip dislocations themselves aren't really necessarily associated with local vascular injuries. And in this, uh, in this particular patient, he has bilateral lower extremity uh, decreased pulses. So that's going to suggest a larger proximal vessel. Uh, the chest x-ray is always should be done in every trauma day, trauma bay. Uh, the use of MRI is pretty controvers controversial to be used routinely. That's not typically uh, my practice. Uh, I think the MRI comes into play later on in the recovery if the patient is continuing to have symptoms well beyond the expected time frame for recovery. An MRI might be useful to evaluate any other injuries to the labrum or other soft tissue components. Uh, so treatment of hip dislocations, uh, pure hip dislocations are generally non-operative. We want to try to get these closed, reduced in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, time testable time frame is usually about six hours. It's been demonstrated that your incidence of uh, avascular necrosis will go up after six hours. But if you are for whatever reason not able to get it in within six hours, that does not give the patient a death sentence for avascular necrosis. Um, the reason, any reason you wouldn't want to perform an acute uh, closed reduction is if you do notice a displaced or non-displaced femoral neck fracture because you don't want to create a much uh, more difficult problem to address. 
uh, operative indications are an irreducible dislocation. If you try and try and you have adequate uh, sedation and muscle relaxation and you just cannot get this reduced uh, after a uh, try or two, I would not recommend uh, performing multiple sedation events in the ER and, and multiple attempts. It's best taken to the operating room and maybe be given one more try. And if it does not go in, then opening up is the, uh, the answer. Uh, if you can see a piece of bone sitting within the joint, you probably should just go ahead and open it since you're going to need to be there anyway. If it's been out for several days, that's most likely not going to be able to be reduced. Or if you have a reduction but it doesn't look uh, concentrically reduced, then there's going to be a uh, intraarticular loose body that's probably causing that or some other structure that's going to need to be addressed. I did have one patient where uh, we tried multiple times and eventually got the hip in and it looked, didn't look right. We opened it up and we actually pulled the sciatic nerve into the uh, hip joint, which was um, a bad day for that patient. Uh, so operative indications are include associated fractures. Now this isn't uh, all inclusive. Not all acetabulum associated acetabulum fractures need to be repaired. Not all femoral head fractures need to be surgically repaired. Femoral neck fractures, however, probably should be stabilized and, and surgically uh, fixed prior to uh, doing a reduction. Uh, arthroscopy, again, that's a little bit uh, maybe controversial or not as common and might become more common as uh, we get more people doing uh, regular and routine hip arthroscopy. It, it is useful if all you're doing is going after loose bodies uh, and rather than doing a large surgical dissection, somebody who's uh, proficient at hip arthroscopy uh, could maybe get that out with less uh, trauma to the hip joint. Uh, it's useful for evaluating the joint surfaces without uh, such large incisions. Uh, typical closed reduction techniques, I mean, I'm sure most of you have done several of these in your training and in your practice. So, uh, simply there's really no major secret. Most of the time they'll go in with uh, traction applied in line with the deformity. I uh, often say kind of recreate the deformity that is typically associated with uh, whatever dislocation you have, either anterior or posterior, uh, then apply traction and then uh, reverse that deformity. That generally works. Keep in mind you should have, you must have adequate sedation and muscle relaxation. Uh, the biggest and strongest of you uh, will have a difficult time, if not impossible time, uh, overcoming the patient's muscular or hip musculature, even the, the young, the, the skinny little patients have very strong hip uh, muscles. And then it's important to gently address the hip stability by uh, flexion of the hip and um, maybe some general rotation. Uh, but trying to avoid frank repeat dislocation to avoid any further cartilaginous uh, damage. Again, post-reduction CT scan is required after a hip uh, reduction to rule out other injuries, from head fractures, intraarticular loose bodies, and incarcerated uh, fragments. I do want to qualify that uh, and state that uh, if we have a loose body located uh, in the fovea here, those are not a big deal and they do not impinge on weight bearing and don't need to be uh, surgically removed. Uh, it are the, it's the loose bodies that are located on the weight bearing surface of the hip that are the most uh, concerning or causing a uh, non-concentric reduction. Uh, and it's going to also uh, evaluate the acetabular fractures. Um, for a simple dislocation that we're treating non-operatively, we generally have them protect the weight bearing, either uh, uh, touch down weight bearing or partial weight bearing uh, for four to six weeks to let the soft tissue settle down. Again, if it's a simple dislocation, the hip joint itself is typically very stable and re-dislocation is fairly uncommon. We just got to let those soft tissues heal in a little bit uh, before we put full pressure on it. Uh, surgical approaches for open reduction uh, for open reduction have been uh, covered in detail by Dr. Taylor. You can either go posteriorly or anteriorly depending on what type of dislocation that you're trying to address uh, just to uh, clinical or I'm sorry uh, art artist renditions of these approaches. Um, generally if you want to you can put the patient in traction to reduce any forces on the cartilage. I don't typically do that. Uh, we just want to get down there uh, as quickly as possible and get the, the loose body out of there. 
since you're in there, uh, it's recommended that you repair any other soft tissue injuries that you see or that are able to be repaired. A lot of times you can tack down a labral tear back to the acetabular rim with some suture anchors and repair any of the joint capsule uh, ruptures. Uh, complications associated with just hip dislocations, uh, you can get up to 20% of simple dislocations can form, uh, develop some type of arthritis uh, due to the cartilage damage of that femoral head kind of scraping across the uh, acetabular rim. Um, femoral head osteonecrosis due to disruption of the femoral head uh, blood supply. It uh, doesn't matter anterior or posterior. It's uh, the main uh, factor associated with increased risk is a time to reduction. So we want to get these reduced as soon as we can. Uh, there's going to be some uh, sciatic nerve injuries with these, up to 20%, uh, usually the perineal division. And again, uh, the recurrent dislocation is quite low. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.